Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back to a new video here on my channel. I teasered it already in a few videos ago where I was talking about the new Asus ZenBook with the new AMD mobile CPUs because I was applying liquid metal to the CPU and then I said but if you have a typical notebook cooler which is not nickel plated it might be a problem after a few months. Typically if you have a notebook like this like the Razer Blade 13, that's the one we're going to use in today's video where we're going to test if we can actually nickel plate a cooler ourselves. And that's necessary. By the way, that's how nickel plating looks like. It's one of my liquid nitrogen coolers. This shiny silver surface, that's a chemical nickel layer. That's what we will try also today with the Razer Blade 13. Typically, if you would open just a typical notebook that's using conventional thermal paste, nickel plating is not necessary. You can just make the contact between CPU, GPU, whatever, with the bare copper and that's totally fine. However, if you apply liquid metal, parts inside liquid metal can form alloys with the copper and the gallium, which is inside, can be corrosive versus copper. Therefore, it will change the composition of the liquid metal, it will completely change the point where it will be solid or liquid and therefore it can be bad for your performance, especially like after one or two months. It will be necessary to reapply the liquid metal. It will look like it dried out, however it did not dry out. The gallium is corrosive versus the copper. It somehow moves its way into the copper, let's say it like that. And the indium will also form alloys with the copper and therefore it will change the composition of the liquid metal. Typically you have gallium, indium and often also tin inside liquid metal because tin is used typically to stretch the composition because it's so much cheaper than gallium and indium and it doesn't really change how liquid metal behaves. It changes the performance a little bit, it lowers uh, the performance but it's not that bad. Anyway, gallium and indium are the main reasons or the main metals which are forming alloys with the naked copper and to prevent that you usually have to use nickel plating in order to create a diffusion barrier between the liquid metal and the copper, therefore the atoms of the liquid metal cannot form alloys and the gallium will not be corrosive towards the copper. We will try today if this works out. I never tried it myself. Obviously I have some experience uh, when it comes to like developing coolers and stuff. That's also something I completely designed and developed myself, but I didn't do the nickel plating myself, obviously. That's, this is chemical nickel. There are typically two different types of nickel plating and we will try the chemical nickel today. The two main ways of nickel plating an object like this is either electroplating or chemical nickel. Electro electroplating is easier, typically also cheaper. It can build up a thicker layer in a shorter amount of time. For example, for the nickel plating with electro or the electroplating, um, you can do 1.2 micrometers per minute at 60 degrees Celsius. Whereas if we do the chemical nickel, then it will be about 2.5 micrometers per hour. So it's a lot slower. So the electroplating will build up a thicker layer in a shorter amount of time. However, it also has some downsides. The main downside is that you cannot plate complex structures. For example, just imagine a pipe or like a hole where you drilled in uh, a thread or whatever, then the nickel will only build up on like the top, maybe go inside by a few millimeters, but it cannot enter a hole simply because the atoms will just search their shortest way and then stick to the walls. They will not just go completely to the bottom of a hole and then decide to go to a wall. That's not how it works. That's why with electroplating, you cannot coat any kind of walls and electroplating therefore for complex structures is something you should avoid. Also with electroplating you will always have a thicker layer building up on edges. So typically that's also how you can spot cheap um, electroplating on for example water coolers. If you look at them and then you look at the edge and it looks like the edge is a little bit thicker than the rest, then you know it's, electro then it's electroplating, then it's not chemical nickel. A few years ago we also had several cases where we had bad nickel plating on water cooling components where the nickel layer was just coming off and that's typically also electroplating. For electroplating you would connect your object to an electrical source and then put it inside a solution of typical nickel sulfate or nickel chloride and then you have to increase the temperature a little bit and then they can build up 
layers of nickel very very fast. For chemical nickel you're using a nickel phosphorus solution with 2 to 12 or 13 percent phosphorus. Lower amount of phosphorus will result in a harder um, surface and that's also one of the positive aspects versus the electroplating that the surface of the chemical nickel can be much harder than the electroplating. The chemical nickel will also perfectly build up inside threads or complex stru structures. That's one of the reasons why I decided to do the chemical nickel on all of my LN2 uh, cooling gear and the anti-corrosive effect of chemical nickel is also better than versus the electroplating. If you're repeating this experiment at home, make sure that you protect yourself properly, get some good gloves and also some good goggles. Make sure you wear them all the time and also check the safety measurements that are recommended when handling those substances. They are openly available for private persons here in Germany, might vary depending where you are from. Typically they're not really dangerous if you know how to handle them, but always be careful. Before we can start with the chemical nickel plating, we first have to get our cooler out of the notebook. The stock image R20 score was 1219 points with uh, the 8565 uCPU, which is a 4 core 8 thread CPU. Maximum core temperature was on core 2 with 80 degrees Celsius. The other cores were sitting in the lower 70s. I completely removed the heatsink from the notebook. You can see there is still the residues from the thermal paste. That's something we will have to remove. Make sure there is no type of plastic or any kind of foam still sticking on your heatsink. We also will have to remove the small sticker that's on here. I would always recommend to use a dry cloth first to remove the thermal paste itself and then use acetone to rewipe the surface and remove all kind of residues that could be left. Yes. One thing you should know about chemical nickel is that everything that's below the surface of the nickel, like this small spot that's on the cooling part right here, will also be visible afterwards. If you're doing the nickel plating for visual purpose, then the electroplating is typically the better option because it's a thicker surface and can hide things which are underneath, but for chemical nickel I think we should still be able to see the structure which we can see right now. First step is 100% cleaning of the heatsink. I found this stuff in Germany, it's called Dr. Galva. I'm not sure if you can source this locally somewhere, uh, depending in which country you're living. It says copper cleaner, mainly consists of alcohol and citrus acid and should be able to clean any kind of copper. It says we have to place it in there for one to maximum 10 minutes. I think five minutes in our case should be enough because the heat sinks already looked quite clean before. Pretty good result from the cleaning I think. You can clearly see a difference from the heat pipe which was in the solution and one part on top which was not. Now just going to clean it with some clear water. In the next step we will have to coat our heatsink with palladium. We need only a very tiny thin layer of palladium but if we don't do that first then the nickel layer will not stick to the copper. This is needed with brass, copper and uh, all those types of alloys and it will take about 20 minutes until we have the palladium layer on the heatsink. Also this can be very dangerous, so again reminder for goggles and gloves. Time to take a look at the result. 
To be honest, I'm not 100% sure what to think of this result. I mean, this looks kind of not that great. I'm also not sure if there will be like negative e effects of the surrounding material, which is around here. I'm not even sure what it is. It could be aluminium. That's why I'm not 100% sure if that's good or not. But we will have to continue to the next bath. First of all, clean it with clean water. Last step, using the nickel electrolyte, we will have to use this for about 4 hours in the oven because at 70 degrees Celsius it will only build up a layer of about 2.5 micrometers per hour. And we need at least about 10 micrometers, 20 would be better but I don't want to wait uh, 10 hours for the first test. That's why we will keep it in the oven for 4 hours. This is the result of four hours sitting in the bath. Currently, I'm not entirely sure. It's, it doesn't look too promising, to be honest. I cannot really see much of the nickel plating, but let's see how it looks outside. I'm really not sure. On the first look, it really still looks like copper, like even dirty copper. It doesn't really look like nickel. I'm going to clean it and dry it, and then we can maybe take a close look at it. The result unfortunately is not that great from what I can see. I mean it has a silverish look. Something certainly happened but it's not that great from what I can see. You can still see the copper definitely through. It still has this copperish color. Therefore I'm not so sure about this result. Not that happy actually. I decided to repeat the first two steps because I really was not satisfied with the result. And after plating it with the palladium it looks much better right now. It still looks really dirty around the heatsink, like on the aluminium part on the side and on here it's it really doesn't look nice but you can see the areas in the middle where we have the copper contact surfaces. It looks more silverish. I think the palladium worked so that's an improvement I think. I'm just going to repeat the step with the nickel plating, put it in the oven again for four hours, see if it works this time. The second attempt turned out much better. You can now see that the contact surface is shining silverish. We definitely have some nickel on there, especially if you compare the right contact surface right here with like the color of the copper of the heat pipe. There's definitely a difference. You can also see that it really doesn't look nice right here and on here we have some stains on the heat pipes. I will try to clean this off and then we will put it back together. After a little bit of grinding and polishing work, this certainly looks much better. Quite happy with the result, going to reapply liquid metal and then put it back together. Any ideas? Cinebench R20 just finished and we have a final score of almost 1600 points and considering that the stock score was 1200 points, an increasement of 400 is really impressive. The maximum temperature is almost the same. We are still hitting about 80 degrees Celsius on the hottest core and mid 70s on the other cores. But the frequency during the benchmark increased on core 0 to core 3. I checked and we were constantly running about 2.8 gigahertz where previously we were only running like 2.2 to 2.3 gigahertz. And that's where we are getting the performance increasement from. Therefore temperature wise not really an improvement but the better temperatures allowed a much bigger headroom in frequency and therefore increased performance. Time for the conclusion. In the end I have to say I was quite satisfied with the result visually after cleaning off all the residues and stains from heat pipes and also from the aluminium parts which was surrounding the heat pipe itself. And 
I'm not sure if that was also the reason why it looked so terrible in between because there was also aluminium involved. Maybe if somebody from you knows more about this, feel free to leave comments down below. In general, I'm not 100% sure if I would really recommend trying this at home. I mean, you can really legally get all of those chemicals here in Germany. You can just order them online. It's really no problem legally, totally fine, but they can be really dangerous. I mean, in here we have sulfuric acid in the palladium activator and then we have nickel sulfate, nickel chloride. I think all of those chemicals are nothing you should just easily deal with. You have to protect yourself properly with good gloves and also good goggles. Make sure you have some that are really protecting yourself and not just have something in front also to the side. That's something that's really important because if you get some stuff of this on your skin or in your eyes, this can end really really badly. That's why I'm not sure if I would really recommend trying something at this at home, especially because not only you have to protect yourself, you also have to be really careful. Some of the fumes out of those chemicals can be dangerous. So if you have it in the bath, sitting in your oven, you have to make sure that you have like an open window next to it or something like that. That's why I'm a little bit reserved recommending trying this at home. We will also see how much of an anti-corrosion effect this will have in like three or four months when we're going to reopen the razor blade and check for the result. Performance wise obviously liquid metal is always great but we will see how good the DIY nickel plating will be. Thanks for joining in and see you next time.